Welcome to our webinar on the UK Corporate Offence of Failure to Prevent Facilitation of Tax Evasion, which came into force on 30 September 2017. The presenter for today is going to be Rosie Ellis, Associate at Milestone International in the UK. Dear Rosie, I give you the floor. Thank you, Gaia. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here. Um, and thanks to TPA for inviting us to speak today. Um, as Gaia said, my name is Rosie. I'm an associate at Milestone International Tax Partners. Um, Milestone are a UK member firm of TPA. Uh, we specialise in multi-jurisdictional and UK inbound and outbound transactions, um, with an emphasis on direct tax. Um, today, I'll be discussing a new piece of UK legislation that was introduced as part of the UK's Criminal Finances Act 2017. Uh, the new rules impose a fine on businesses who are convicted of failing to prevent their staff from facilitating tax evasion. Um, we'll also delve into a broader discussion about how the UK has sought to tackle tax evasion and aggressive tax avoidance in recent years. We'll hopefully demonstrate how important it is that businesses and their advisors are aware of the new rules and how the landscape has changed over recent years. Okay, so as you can see on the slide in front of you, um, we're going to structure this, website where, uh, sorry, this webinar into four parts. Um, sorry, guys, if we can go back one slide, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> um, firstly, we'll provide you with us some background to the UK's approach to tax evasion and aggressive tax avoidance. Uh, we'll give you the context to why the UK has introduced such a vast um, range of legislation in recent years in this area. Um, and then I'm going to walk through the new corporate offence. Um, we'll look at its application to both UK and foreign businesses and how the offences differ in their scope. Um, thirdly, I'll look at the defences that are available should a business commit an offence. Um, we'll also importantly be discussing the measures that businesses must be putting in place to ensure they are protected about, from the new rules. And finally, if you're all still with us, um, we hope we'll illustrate how important it is that businesses review, review their tax risk management strategy in light of the UK's changing tax avoidance, tax evasion landscape for those investing into the UK. Um, I'll also look through the scope and the application of a few key provisions introduced over recent years that harness serious penalties should your client all your businesses fall foul of the rules. Um, and most importantly, we'll also look at the steps that you as business leaders and advisors should be taking now in light of the changes. Okay, um, can we switch to the next slide? Perfect. Okay, um, so a good place to start, I suppose, is to pose the question, um, why should I or my business care about a small piece of UK tax evasion legislation? Well, to sum it up simply, the legislation is wide in its scope and in its application. Importantly, it's only a small drop in the ocean in respect to the overhaul in the tax framework that we've seen in recent years. Uh, the legislation applies to both UK entities and foreign entities that have a UK nexus, and a business can be liable under the offence without senior management knowledge or awareness of any wrongdoing. Uh, this means that businesses will need to ensure that the behaviour of their employees and agents is regularly monitored in this area. Uh, should an offence occur, the businesses will need to provide a defence demonstrating they have put in place adequate prevention procedures to ensure that, that uh, the offence shouldn't have happened in the first place. Uh, the rules can therefore be seen as an example of a trend in UK tax policy designed to create a behaviour and mindset change in taxpayers, their advisors and businesses regarding tax matters. Um, can we switch to the next slide? Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, so firstly, to take a few steps back and explore how we've ended up in a position where the UK government has allowed to enact tax legislation that's so broad in its scope, it's worth considering the change in the UK government's approach to tax matters over the past 10 years. As many of you will be aware, the international tax landscape has been recently overhauled at lightning speed from a number of different directions. The UK is no exception to this. We've seen a wealth of changes from the domestic front, numerous EU measures, and we've played a key role in some of the most significant changes to international tax via our involvement in the OECD's base erosion and profit shifting, you probably all know this as the BEPS project, and the common reporting standards. So, why the overhaul? The 2008 global financial crisis left many governments reviewing their income and revenue flows, ultimately trying to figure out a way to ensure the books and budgets balance. One of the key tools used by the UK government to increase its income and revenue flow was to address the flaws in the tax system. The focus has predominantly been on those with overseas interests and assets, such as internationally mobile individuals and multinational businesses with ties to numerous jurisdictions with the objective of increasing income from tax receipts. The UK government chose to 
specifically target illegal tax evasion, aggressive tax avoidance and taxpayer non-compliance in a bid to increase disclosure and taxpayer transparency. Uh, coupled with the focus of taxpayer transparency we've seen in recent years, the UK has also seen a distinct change in the public's misperception and criticism of tax planning strategy. Uh, the focus of the UK debate, encouraged by members of the opposition government, has been towards the payment of one's fair share of tax. Together, these two factors, i.e. taxpayer transparency and the government's perception, has allowed the UK government to introduce a wealth of new legislation that acts to strengthen transparency and increase taxpayers' reporting obligations. With the green light from government to push forward this change, the onus of reporting responsibility is predominantly focused on an individual taxpayer's duty to self-report and corporate entities and advisors to disclose information on their associated taxpayers. Interestingly, uh, sorry, interestingly, this plan has come to fruition over recent years. Um, as our tax authority in the UK, HMRC, has had a success rate of over 80% in tax avoidance cases. With the current political will and public sympathy very much in HMRC's favour, they've had the ability to extend their powers and aspects that were perhaps unthinkable just 10 years ago. Structuring the rules in this way has allowed HMRC to apply penalties, which leads to increased income revenue for non-cooperation and reduces the need for HMRC to spend its diminished resources on policing the new rules. While we agree that the flaws in the UK tax system should be addressed, the extent and effort that the UK government has gone to in a bid to increase taxpayer transparency has created an environment with an ever stricter regime of rec reporting requirements and obligations. The net effect of this is that there are often instances where more individuals and businesses are captured than the focus and the design of the original legislation. As you can probably imagine, all of this can lead to businesses suffering unnecessary and increased expenditure to assess the impact of new and changing rules and has made more complex an already complex tax system. Um, can we switch to the next slide? Thank you. So, <laughs> um, now we've gone through the context in which the corporate offence has been introduced, I can have a look at the offence in detail. The next few slides will provide you with a walkthrough of the new provisions and the law on tax evasion in the UK. In short, the new corporate offence will apply to make businesses liable for the actions of their staff if such staff criminally facilitate tax evasion. The new rules, which, as Guy said, came into force on the 30th of September 2017, expand on an existing criminal liability whereby a corporate offence would apply if staff facilitated tax evasion. However, under the old provision, the prosecutors had to show that senior management, which is typically the board of directors, were involved in and aware of the illegal activity conducted by their staff. As you can imagine, the UK government deemed the historic rules to be fairly inadequate. They allowed a board of directors to effectively turn a blind eye to criminal acts taking place, or even created an environment whereby personnel were dis discouraged from reporting staff's conduct to senior management because senior management would then be required to act. In addition, the old rules, under the old rules, the UK government was finding it difficult to hold large multinational organisations to account where they had decentralised decision-making departments, often spread across multiple jurisdictions. So, to satisfy the new provision of the criminal facilitation of tax evasion, a person deliberately and dishonestly must help another person to evade tax. But the new corporate offence can be committed even if senior management has or had no awareness of the staff of the conduct of their staff. Um, if the penalties are quite significant, if found guilty, the business can be liable to a fine that is paid out of the business's assets. Note there's no maximum fine that's specified in the legislation, and the business could be subject to an, an, an ancillary order. Um, an ancillary order is designed to redress the harm caused by the offender through the confiscation of profits that were made by the company or the partnership from the tax evasion that took place. An example of this could be the confiscation of profits received from a client who then went on to facilitate the tax evasion. Can we switch to the next slide? So, to explain the contents of the new corporate offence, a good place to start is to explore what actually constitutes tax evasion under UK law. As with many of your home country's rules, First and foremost, tax evasion is illegal. The UK Tax Authority describes tax evasion 
as fraudulently evading or cheating HMRC of tax that is lawfully owed. HMRC then go on to state that tax evasion does not include making a mistake about the tax that is owed. Tax evasion requires dishonesty. The legislation that contains the new offence includes the definition of a UK tax evasion offence. The definition is a two-limb test that can be satisfied by either an offence of cheating the public revenue or an offence consisting of being knowingly concerned in or taking steps with a view to, fraudulently, to the fraudulent evasion of tax. The offence of cheating the public revenue is an interesting term under UK law. The term is a common law offence, meaning it is not laid down in statute in the UK, but has harnessed its meaning through UK case law. From case law, we know that the, effect, that the phrase includes any form of fraudulent conduct or cheating the general public. This is taken from the case of Crown and Hudson in the UK. The result is that HMRC is deprived of money it is otherwise entitled to. This term is often used in the most serious cases of wrongdoing and the most unusual of offences. If a person is convicted of cheating the public revenue, the offence carries a maximum penalty of life imprisonment or an unlimited fine. Finally, and importantly, cheating the public revenue is a conduct offence. This means that the prosecution at trial does not need to prove that the defendant has caused an actual loss of monies due to the tax evasion. So, examples of cheating the public revenue, they can include making a false statement or delivering a false document to HMRC relating to income tax, uh, failure to account or register for VAT, or failing to disclose income to HMRC. Um, the second limb of the definition in the statute is the fraudulent evasion of tax. This alludes to a statutory offence laid out in UK statute, such as the fraudulent evasion of VAT or income tax. To provide some context to the new provisions, the UK's Chartered Institute of, of Taxation, known as CIOT, has provided some specific examples of what might constitute the facilitation of tax evasion. The examples include the intentional manipulation of documents, for example, falsify, falsifying dates on dividend documents and board minutes to alter the year in which the tax would ordinarily be due. Secondly, the knowledge that a client wants to set up a structure to try and hide income, gains, or assets from a tax authority and continuing to help them to facilitate that structure. Finally, hiding expenses that are ordinarily disallowable in a category that HMRC is unlikely to question. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so to break down the elements of the new corporate offence, we first need to establish who can facilitate tax evasion and which corporates can be liable under the offence. Both definitions are designed to be wide in their remit, covering a range of situations and personnel. So, a relevant body includes a company that is incorporated or a partnership, which includes LLPs. As you can see from the slide, an associated person is defined as an employee, an agent or any other person who performs services for and on behalf of that business. And if we go to the next slide. It's also quickly worth pointing out that the offence applies to the evasion of a wide range of UK taxes, as you can see on the screen. Importantly, this includes income tax, capital gains tax, and corporation tax. And on to the next slide. Okay, so the UK tax evasion facilitation offence. So, to break the offence down, the offence is designed to be applicable irrespective of whether the relevant body or the, associate, or the associated person is based in the UK or overseas. But if the, UK, if the offence is committed, it will be trialled by the UK court. To be prosecuted under the offence, the business must satisfy all three stages as shown on the slide. Stage 1. Firstly, the taxpayer must commit criminal tax evasion. For the avoidance of doubt, anything falling below tax evasion will not be within the scope of the rules and the corporate offence will therefore not apply. The guidance is clear that it is not necessary that the taxpayer is actually convicted of tax evasion. In instances where the taxpayer voluntarily comes forward and makes a disclosure to HMRC about an offence, there may be no need for a criminal prosecution, but the offence could still apply. The body investigating the business in this instance will still need to prove that, that the criminal tax evasion took place by the tax player. Stage two, an associated person must deliberately and dishonestly 
facilitate the taxpayer evasion. Under UK law, it is already a crime for a person to facilitate tax evasion. However, the focus of the new rules is to target and fine businesses through the actions of their associated persons. Note that accidental, ignorant or even negligent facilitation of tax evasion will not result in an offence being committed by the business. And finally, stage three, the offence is a strict liability offence. As such, if stages one and two are satisfied, the business will have committed the new offence unless it can show it has put in place reasonable prevention, preventative procedures. The preventative procedures will form part of the defence of the business and will be discussed in further detail later. Um, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so as set out earlier, the wide scope of the legislation means the rules don't just apply to UK businesses. There's also a second limb to the offence that applies to foreign businesses with a UK nexus. The foreign offence is slightly narrower, narrower in its remit. To be within the scope, businesses must satisfy stages one, and three, one to three on the previous slide and, in addition, the business must have a UK nexus and there must be an element of dual criminality. So, a UK nexus will be triggered if the business was incorporated in the UK, it carries on a business in the UK, or has an associated person located in the UK at the time of the offence. Dual criminality, on the other hand, means that the overseas jurisdiction, which is where the, end, the foreign entity is based, must have an equivalent tax evasion offence at the taxpayer level. To break this down, this means there must be a tax evasion offence as prescribed under UK law, for example, the fraudulent evasion of tax or cheating the public revenue. As such, if the individual commits an offence that constitutes tax evasion in the foreign country, but those actions do not meet the UK tax evasion definition, no offence will be committed. In addition, there must also be an equivalent offence that targets associated persons criminal, criminally facilitating tax evasion. So, if the foreign jurisdiction has stricter rules on tax evasion, for example, the negligent facilitation of tax evasion is criminal, the UK test will not be met and no, and no offence will be committed. What's interesting about the, in the interplay between the UK and the foreign offences is that neither the legislation nor the guidance issued by the government provides any insight into how the tax laws of foreign countries should be proven or brought to the UK courts. As you can therefore imagine, this may create difficulty when prosecuting a business under the foreign offence. It will therefore be critical that information of the offence committed is passed between foreign countries and the UK, and HMRC may need to rely on mutual agreement procedures, if available, and this, as you can probably imagine, will be a lengthy process. So, what defences does a business have should they find themselves liable? Can we switch to the next slide? <clears throat> the legislation allows for two defences when either the UK or the foreign offence has been committed. A defence applies in circumstances where the business has put in place prevention procedures or it was not reasonable for the business to put, it put in place procedures. This will only apply in a, in a very limited amount of circumstances though. If HMRC or the National Crime Agency in the UK become aware that an offence has been committed, either by self-reporting from the business or a tip-off, the business will be asked to provide its defence to the body investigating the crime. If successful, the business is not liable to the fine or ancillary order. HMRC have highlighted that a company can self-report if a relevant body discovers that an offence has been committed. The business can write to HMRC detailing the tax evasion offence, the individual that facilitated the evasion, and the prevention procedures that the business has in place at the time. Self-reporting does not guarantee that the business won't be prosecuted, but it will be taken into account when, invest when the investigating body is deciding whether to prosecute the business and could form part of the defence. Okay, so the next slides will unpack the prevention procedures in a little bit more detail. So, as I stated earlier, the UK government has issued guidance covering how a business should put in place prevention procedures. I've included the principles on this slide and we'll run through them in further detail. Can we run to the next slide? Thank you. <clears throat> 
all businesses that meet the criteria of a relevant body or have a UK nexus should undertake a risk assessment to assess the nature and extent of exposure to the offence and how any risk can be managed. However, given the scope of the legislation, it is most critical that businesses involved in the financial services, tax, legal and accounting sectors undertake a risk assessment and implement prevention procedures. This slide includes some of the key features that the UK government states should be considered as part of a business's risk assessment process. I'll quickly run through these now. The business should assess if any associated person has the motive, opportunity and means to facilitate tax evasion offences. The UK guidance that accompanies the new, the new offence explains that businesses should sit at the desk of an associated person. As you can see, this test this test criteria is rather subjective and can be pre pretty tedious, particularly for large corporations. Aspects to include in this assessment could include reviewing staff's career history, the resources and information that are available at the workplace, the level of supervision, the level of supervision and training provided by more senior members of staff. The size of the relevant body should also be considered. The guidance accompanying the legislation explains that large organisations may exercise less day-to-day -day oversight of personnel providing services on the business's behalf. As such, large organisations may need to implement more stringent criteria, such as clear training and a written pol policy on their approach to the, to the rules. The third aspect is the nature and complexity of the business and the trade. Many of you listening to this webinar will likely have some connection with or work in tax. Those businesses providing tax advice to their clients and customers will likely be at, more, at a more considerable risk of the rules. As such, the consequences of committing an offence should be clearly outlined to the staff. An example of internal risk is uh, an example of internal risk is if the business's policy on tax evasion is not clear, or if no training has been historically provided to employees. This ties into the point above. It is key that businesses assess the levels of training that is necessary to provide. Much of this will depend on the level of client communication, the seniority of personnel, and the work that is being undertaken. Examples of customer and client risk include whether due diligence procedures have been undertaken. This includes whether, whether the client is, regularly, uh, sorry, is regulated by a professional body, whether anti-money laundering regulations have been considered, and how source of funds were confirmed as part of the onboarding process. Examples of country risk include an assessment of whether the customer or the client is from a jurisdiction outside the scope of the common reporting standard or if the country is blacklisted for tax purposes. For sectoral risk, if the business handles high value cash transactions or is involved in the tax sector, this will form part of the business's assessment. And finally, any transactional risk. This aspect looks at the risks relating to the specific client transactions being undertaken and will often depend on the sector the business is involved in. Examples of high risk transactions could include those involving politically exposed persons or transactions that involve complex tax planning. And um, can we move to the next slide? Thank you. <clears throat> So, the UK government's guidance explains that the relevant body's prevention procedures should be proportionate to the risk that an associated person could commit an offence and should be implemented and then monitored periodically to ensure it remains effective. So, if we take the six principles from the previous slides, we can look at how a business should be putting in place prevention procedures based on their specific risk. To reduce an associated person's opportunity to facilitation of tax evasion, Work should be subject to scrutiny by a partner or a member of senior management with the objective to improve the detection of tax evasion. The business should also look to implement tax evasion specific training covering what constitutes tax evasion under UK law, as we've already been through, and the penalties for a taxpayer if they fall foul of the rules. To reduce an associated person's motive to facilitate tax evasion, the business should clearly set out the consequences of doing so in its written policy. An example of this would be the termination of that employee's contract. Clear internal procedures to report wrongdoing could include who to report to if a colleague or a client or a customer is suspected to be involved in tax evasion or the facilitation thereof, and 
who can answer questions or concerns. The business's written policy on tax evasion could include the outcome of the risk assessment undertaken and the risk areas identified, a zero tolerance approach of the business to tax evasion and the business's commitment to preventing the involvement of its personnel in facilitating evasion, the business's, sorry, the business's commitment to tax compliance over profits, what the consequences of facilitating tax evasion are for the business and the, and the member of staff involved, consequences for whistleblowers, for example, there'll be no retribution for staff that disclose information on their colleagues, how and who will monitor and assess the risk internally, and who is responsible for disciplinary procedures within the business. As you can see from the above, the prevention procedures to be put in place by a business will need to be tailored to the, to the specifics of the business in question. As you can probably imagine, there are a number of providers and legal firms that have created products designed to fulfill the business's prevention procedure requirements. I guess to sum this up, the key aspect here is to show that the business has reviewed its risk, addressed its shortfalls, and can prove that it was providing ongoing monitoring and training to its staff on the application of the offence. As shown in the previous section of this slide pack, in light, of the, in light of the UK's overhaul of tax evasion, tax avoidance and non-compliance, uh, it is imperative that businesses and their tax advisors review and monitor their group structure to ensure that the business remains compliant with the relevant tax laws of the countries in which they operate. As we've seen in the UK's new, with the UK's new corporate offence for the facilitation of tax evasion, penalties and fines for non-compliance or to even not show that, that the sufficient defence procedures have been put in place by the business can have significant ramifications. The next section will show how business can utilise a tax risk management strategy to ensure it remains compliant, and the key areas of the UK's compliance tax landscape we feel your clients should be aware of. As shown in the previous section of this slide pack, in light of the UK's overhaul of tax evasion, tax avoidance and non-compliance legislation, it is imperative that businesses and their tax advisors review and monitor their group structure to ensure that businesses remain compliant with the relevant tax laws of the countries in which they operate in. As we've seen with the UK's new corporate offence for the facilitation of tax evasion, penalties and fines for non-compliance or to even not show that sufficient defence procedures have been put in place by the business can have significant ramifications. The next section will show how business can utilise a tax risk management strategy to ensure that it remains compliant and the key areas of the UK's compliance tax landscape we feel your clients should be aware of. So, how does a tax risk management strategy work? The business's tax risk management strategy is broadly about ensuring legisl legislative compliance, both future and current, and dealing with reputational risk to the business should something go wrong. The UK's tax avoidance and tax evasion legislation is key to this, given its breadth and the public's perception and, of course, journalistic reporting towards tax matters. As a starting point, businesses should be reviewing and identifying areas of tax risk. Key questions could consider. Has the tax compliance audit been undertaken to ensure filing deadlines are met and the, and the entities are properly paying tax? Are the legis legislative rules the group is operating on still current and enforced? Is the group predicting and preparing for future changes to legislation and improving relations with their local tax administration. As each business is different, it is key that the views of senior management and the group's appetite to tax risk are understood. The personnel in charge of the tax risk management strategy may need to assist in changing the views of the board as regards the importance of tax. The UK's tax penalty regime is broad and includes both general penalties and specific legislative, legislative charges. HMRC have been attempting to apply a clear and concise penalty regime in the UK over recent years. But as you'll probably see from the next few slides, there's still a little bit of work to be done. For the general provision, a tax, pen a tax penalty broadly arises from two types of action by the taxpayer. The first is mistakes that are careless, negligent, deliberate or fraudulent as regards tax returns or the failure to notify the liability to tax. These are known as culpable penalties. The second is the failure to abide by a compliance obligation, known as a failure penalty. Culpable penalties are designed to collect a percentage of the tax lost by HMRC. The regi regime is designed to influence taxpayer behaviour, with penalties ratcheting up depending on the actions of the individual that resulted in the non-payment of tax. As you can see from the screen, the penalties for a failure to notify a liability to tax or errors and inaccuracies in a tax return range from 
30% of the potential lost revenue for careless action up to 100% of the potential lost revenue for deliberate and concealed action. These are the maximum penalties um, as stated by HMRC. However, a penalty may be reduced if the taxpayer makes an unprompted disclosure of the tax unpaid. There is a separate, and as you can imagine, more onerous regime for offshore non-compliance. HMRC increases the penalties for the above, for example, errors in return, failure to notify to liability, where there is a UK tax liability in relation to an offshore matter. An, um, an example of an offshore penalty could be where a capital gain arises from the sale of land, property, or assets that are held outside the UK, but this gain is not disclosed on a corporation tax return, or a UK tax resident person um, receives income that has a non-UK source, for example, overseas property income. The offshore regime came into force in 2011 and can be broken down into three categories determined on the basis of the, uh, of the exchange of information facility that the UK has with that foreign country. Category 1 penalties apply the normal penalty regime of up to 100% of lost revenue, and these are for countries in which the UK has an automatic exchange of information. Category 2 is for penalties of up to 150%, and they apply where information is exchanged only on request. And examples of Category 2 penalties include the BVI, Gibraltar, Jersey, Luxembourg, and for some strange reason, this list also includes Austria. Uh, category 3 penalties are penalties of up to 200%, and they apply where a territory does not share information with the UK. Examples include the United Arab Emirates, Monaco, and Panama. As with the domestic regime, HMRC may reduce the penalties if the taxpayer makes an unprompted disclosure of the tax owed. Can we move to the next slide? The UK has a separate penalty regime for the late filing and late payment of tax. A late filing penalty can arise when a company fails to submit its tax, a corporation tax return to HMRC. The regime operates slightly differently to the penalties for errors and non-compliance. Fixed and daily rate penalties can be applied in the first instance with a percentage of lost revenue penalties applied after a more significant elapsing of time, and this ratchets up depending on the company's behaviour. Again, the penalties for late filing can increase up to 200% if the matter is in relation to an offshore. As with the culpable penalties regime, the objective is to influence taxpayer behaviour. This is designed to encourage unprompted disclosures and act as a deterrent from deliberate and concealed action by a taxpayer. Finally, the late payment regime applies an additional and separate penalty calculated as a percentage of the tax that is late charged at different intervals, i.e. three months late, six months late, and so on. The previous slides covered the general tax penalty regime that applied in the UK. However, there's also very specific legislative penalties that can apply. These are similar to the, to the UK's corporate offence that form the basis of this webinar. When preparing for this presentation and looking into the UK's tax evasion and tax avoidance landscape and how it has changed over recent years, I came across a publication that the UK's Treasury published in November 2017. The publication provides a walkthrough of the changes made in respect of tax evasion, aggressive tax avoidance and non-compliance since the UK has had a change in government in 2010. The publication details 133 new measures that have been introduced in the area of tax evasion and tax avoidance. Um, I've included a link um, in the slide deck so if any of you are interested in looking at the UK's uh, changes in greater de detail. Um, as you can probably imagine, we don't have time to cover all the, de all the measures in detail. So the next section will focus on the UK's DOTAS re regime, accelerated payment notices, the general anti-abuse rule, and the UK's implementation of the common reporting standard. We, as tax advisors, consider these changes could have, a, have the biggest impact for our clients both from a reputational perspective and the financial penalties that can be incurred. So the first specific penalty is the UK's disclosure of tax avoidance regime, known as DOTAS. The DOTAS regime is designed to target prepackaged, marketed and tax-driven avoidance regimes. HMRC is clear that normal planning, tax planning remains legal and does not fall within the scope of these rules. The UK's DOTAS regime is designed to enable HMRC to keep up to date with tax avoidance schemes and make amendments to the UK tax legislation as necessary. This is all in a bid to shift public behaviour. 
Since its introduction, the regime has continually expanded to bring more taxes within its scope. The regime has been largely successful in deterring taxpayers from entering into a tax avoidance scheme that falls within the scope of DOTAS. Significant penalties apply, and the amount is generally a £600 daily penalty or a £5,000 fixed penalty. As part of the DOTAS regime and the general anti-abuse rule, known as PGAR, which is discussed in the next slide, the UK government has also introduced accelerated payment notices via its Finance Act 2014. While the, Do while the DOTAS legislation is key, it was the introduction of the APN notices that really acted to shut down the tax avoidance industry in the UK. An APN is effectively a pay the tax now notice, where there is an open inquiry into, ta into a tax avoidance arrangement. The regime is designed to promote the early settlement of disputed tax avoidance cases and change the economics of using tax avoidance schemes. Interestingly, there's around 60,000 APNs that have been issued, and this has collected around £3 billion worth of tax. The legislation requires that, ta that the taxpayer must amend their tax return, withdraw their appeal, or risk penalties and a payment of the tax up front. If HMRC issues an APN notice in an inquiry case, the taxpayer has 90 days to pay the amount detailed on the notice. This is usually the tax or the national insurance advantage that relates to the scheme. And if, a, if the penalty date is missed, additional penalties apply. Interestingly, for now it looks like the APN regime is here to stay. The UK's Court of Appeal dismissed an appeal into the High Court decision as to the legality of the AP, APN regime in late 2017. And can we move to the next slide? Thank you. <clears throat> so we'll quickly turn now to our general anti-abuse rule and a recent change in law for the enablers of tax avoidance schemes. As with the general penalty regime, these penalties are designed to impact, impact taxpayer behaviour. They act as a deterrent for taxpayers that are considering entering into an aggressive tax avoidance arrangement. As part of the UK's Second Finance Act of 2017, the government introduced new legislation that applies penalties to the enablers of tax avoidance. This legislation is principally aimed at tax advisors. An enabler is defined as any person who is responsible for the design or marketing that results in another person entering into an abusive tax arrangement. An abusive tax arrangement is where either the court or a UK tribunal shuts down a tax arrangement or an agreement is entered into between HMRC and that taxpayer that the regime in question does not work. When the abusive tax arrangements are defeated in the court or at the tribunal, each person who enabled the arrangement may be liable to a penalty. The penalty for each enabler is equal to the amount of consideration either received or receivable by them for enabling those arrangements. And finally, the GAR. The GAR is a specific anti-avoidance piece of legislation uh, that was introduced in 2013 and is designed to counteract tax advantages that arise from tax arrangements deemed to be abusive. Since the introduction of the GAR in 2013, there has been much criticism over the uncertainty of how the rule actually applies. The word abusive is designed to narrow the scope of the legislation. The rule looks at different courses of action that a taxpayer could choose from, and any reasonable course of action will be outside the scope of the GAR, and it will not apply. As such, an arrangement will be abusive if entering into or carrying out that arrangement cannot be regarded as a reasonable course of action. As such, an arrangement could be within the scope of GAR if it's against the spirit or policy of the law, seeks to exploit shortcomings in tax legislation, or is contrived or abnormal in that it produces tax results that are inconsistent with the economic effect of the underlying transaction. A GAR penalty will apply if HMRC had been provided with a tax document, for example, a tax return, that has been completed on the basis of a tax advantage and the taxpayer knew it was given on that basis. It could also be applied um, if HMRC has issued the taxpayer with a counteraction notice and finally, the tax advantage has been counteracted, for example, by the court. The penalty is levelled at 60% of the value of the advantage that would be payable had HMRC not made a, a counteraction notice or an amount that HMRC should have been paid in the first in Can we move on to the next slide, please? Uh, finally, to turn internationally, we'll briefly consider the UK's approach to the OECD's Common Reporting Standard. 
The Common Reporting Standard, as many of you will be aware, is one of the most significant multilateral efforts to inc increase taxpayer transparency that we've seen over recent years. The UK held itself out to be one of the, of the key proponents of the design of the Common Reporting Standard, working closely with the OECD. As many of you will know, the Common Reporting Standard is a global, international, automatic exchange of information network with a premise to tackle tax evasion and increase global taxpayer transparency. It's based on the US's FATCA model, but notably does not include the US as a signatory. The US specifically states that it will join, that it will not join the standard as their FATCA program is sufficient. The Common Reporting Standard will exchange personal and financial information on those deemed to be the controllers of certain accounts and or entities. The UK began making its first exchange, automatic exchanges under the CRS in September 2017 as an early adopter of the legislation. It's expected that around 100 jurisdictions will be a party to the CRS by the second round of exchanges due to take place on the 30th of September 2018. As part of the UK's adoption and implementation of the CRS, the UK government has introduced a new provision known as the Requirement to Correct. The Requirement to Correct legislation allows individuals who have undeclared UK income, capital gains and inheritance tax liabilities through offshore matters to make a disclosure to HMRC about their affairs prior to HMRC receiving such information under the second round of exchanges due to take place on the 30th of September 2018. The regime is designed for HMRC to then take action to recover the unpaid tax, which means that the taxpayer could be liable to interest and penalties for late payments. Failure to disclose of offshore matters prior to the information being received by HMRC as a result of a CRS exchange will result in penalties being introduced which is set at a minimum of 100% of the tax owed. This is a key example of the UK tackling tax evasion and tax avoidance through behavioural change legislation and through a multilateral effort. The effect is that hopefully individuals will come forward to rectify their tax liabilities before they are caught. In summary, in recent times, the UK has sought to introduce legislation of strict liability, as is the case with the new corporate offence that's formed the basis of this webinar, or legislation that puts the responsibility of compliance onto the tax advisor. Both aspects can have a significant impact on the change of behaviour of taxpayers and their advisors, and some, such as the corporate offence that tackles tax evasion, is welcome. However, the extent to which legislation such as the new corporate offence, can constitute another paper-filling and box-ticking exercise, adding to the wealth of compliance obligations that businesses already have remains to be seen. So, does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, Rosie, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us, and also <laughs> Thank special thanks to all attendees for joining us today. Thanks again for joining us, Rosie, and thanks to Thank all you. attendees. Thank you.